One, two, three, four. You check the door handle. Yeah, the door is locked, all right. The piece of dark glass separating you and the front of the car looks sturdy, too. There is nothing left to do but wait. You didn't have time to think about it before, but you realize now that you're hungry? No, not exactly. It's not the rumbling in your stomach that grabs your attention. It's the need that starts somewhere in your abdomen and spreads to your chest, throat, and the back of the head. After a while, the need transforms into an overwhelming wave of anger. You clench your fists and jaw. You kick the wall that divides you and the driver. You feel like screaming. You're fuming inside, but despite trying to cover it up, it shows on your contorted face. Eventually, it catches his eye. Are you scheming something? Keep your impotent rage in check, or else I'll do it for you. Impotent? Just watch, you bastard. You hit the window with your elbow, then lie on your back and try to kick it in. You think it budges. The car comes to a stop. My patience is wearing thin, fledgling. One last chance. Settle down. Okay, sure, I'm good. Got it out of my system. Almost. Brick. He scoffs. You done? You only gaze at him in response. Good. He starts the engine. You feel exhausted. The anger that you erupted with is now a smoldering fire. But your hunger remains. It takes you another 20 or so minutes to get to your destination. As the door opens, you try to get your bearings. You're still in New York. That much is certain. Queens, maybe. After me, no sudden movements, please. You approach a nice-looking door that houses a two-story gallery called the Art Hall. Two large men in suits flank the door on both sides, and they give your companion a nod as you approach. <sighs> Prompted by the stranger guiding you, you walk inside. The gallery is full, which is unusual at this hour, to say the least. About two dozen faces fill the showroom, and a number of waiters navigate the gathering, serving drinks. The visitors are well dressed for the most part, but it's unclear what they have gathered for. Nobody seems particularly interested in the art pieces on the wall, and the atmosphere is polite, unnaturally so. Many guests turn their back on you, and the stranger who brought you here, their glances are varied. <sighs> you see an open contempt on a few faces, and animated interests on others. Most of the eyes in the room calmly observe you, as if wishing to appraise your worth. The last time you felt like this was at your previous job interview. It was like being a piece of livestock, inspected from all sides for any imperfection. So your wage could be haggled down, it was dehumanizing and made you feel dirty. 
When they called you the next day to offer you the job, you declined. Even when you're a nobody, you become even less if you trade your dignity for a paycheck. The memory makes you feel warmer inside, even now, although the state of your bank account never did. <laughs> Good evening, Kadir, and to you, child. The noble, cold voice takes you out of your head and back into the situation at hand, the gallery, a crowd of strangers. You being brought here against your will. For what purpose? The room awaits your response. Good evening, miss. You are addressing the Princess of New York City, Helene Panhard, child of Michaela. Thank you, my sheriff, but I am capable of introducing myself. She is somewhat plain looking and doesn't seem to possess a great deal of charm, but still the entire room is intently focused on her voice. She has influence over these people. That much is clear. You may address me as Prince, Child. I realize your introduction into unlife was abrupt, and I understand your sire left shortly after. The rules of our society dictate that I punish you both for this transgression. A murmur of agreement, maybe, can be heard from the gathered audience. But I am willing to listen to what our loyal sheriff has to say about the circumstances of your embrace first. You decide that it's better to stay silent and to listen to the whole situation unfold. It feels like you're out of your depth here. Shall we begin? You are about to be judged by the court of New York City, Kadir. Please tell us how you found this fledgling and what happened on your way here. Court? Prince? Is this some kind of secret society? Make believe? A trusted informant who has chosen to remain anonymous at this time tipped me off about a suspicious kindred appearing in one of our domains. Upon investigating, I found them gone, but this fledgling remained in their place. The hunger made him savage a prostitute and his client in the Bronx brothel, belonging to one of the ministry. I have already spoken to Sansarik about this and made sure it will blow over. Regarding the fledgling himself? Hunger is the heart of a vampire's existence. To ignore it is to tempt the beast to take over in its desire to feed. To overindulge in feeding may threaten the masquerade while staining what humanity you have left. In coteries of New York, having a high hunger is indicated by a progressively thicker bloody frame around the screen, like the one you see now. As you, your hunger grows, so does this indicator. Your hunger may increase when you call upon your vampiric powers, or 
when you need to mend your wounds. When your hunger reaches the maximum level, you will receive a warning after you complete a piece of the story. Ignore it at your peril. Some choices might only become visible if your hunger is high enough. Similarly, high hunger may block off some choices, as you will be able to see after pressing CONTINUE. To decrease your hunger, you will need to feed. Whenever you see a feeding opportunity, you can take the risk to hunt and slake your hunger. You will need to keep the hunger at bay if you are to uphold the masquerade and survive the night that awaits you. <laughs> You open your eyes. The bed isn't warm. The room is filled with artificial light from the ceiling. The solia metal door is closed. Normally you would stretch for a bit. On some mornings, you'd probably throw a quilt over yourself and snooze a moment longer. But that was before. That way you woke up now you are fully conscious, no grogginess, nothing weighing you down, just nagging need in the back of your head. Hunger. Not as severe as the last time, but unmistakably there. You get up and open the door to the main room. A digital clock on the TV shows you the time. 9.04 p.m. You walk over to the blinds and retract them cautiously. So that's what your waking hour is going to look like now. You miss the sunlight already. You're seriously considering just walking out of the apartment and figuring this all out by yourself. But then you come back to the memory of Quadir's exotic sword being raised in the gallery. Maybe sticking around isn't that bad an idea after all. You keep jumping channels around half an hour and then switch to streaming services. Almost as if the universe had a sense of irony you catch true blood in the flood of recommendations. Psst. The doorbell rings. Ding dong! It's Sophie. Good evening, William. Slept well? Like a dead man. Curious wording, but not that far from the truth, I suppose. No use dwelling on it. I think you will agree with time. You made the right choice yesterday. I can teach you many things about yourself, your blood, its desires and its power. We will begin tonight. You are hungry, yes? I'm sure you are. Our kind always is. There is only one remedy. The blood. The drinks we had yesterday at Elysium are not the usual way to slake your thirst. So tonight I will assist you. In your first foray into hunting, you need to learn to sense the kind of blood you desire, to understand how you can use the kind's vulnerability to your advantage. So let's get this straight. We are predators. Humans are prey. That's pretty grim. I know what you feel. I remember the notion. But you will inevitably grow beyond it. You need blood to thrive. You will find that drinking moderate amounts of it regularly will keep the hunger and the whispers of the beasts away. You might think of yourself as monstrous, but there is a balance to be found here. <sighs> the 
the kiss gives the kind pleasure. You might remember this from your own embrace. Some can even become addicted to the sensation. But if you do it right, they tend to misremember your feeding. After all, vampires do not exist. They are myths, fairy tales, and pop culture mainstays, correct? She gives you a sly, knowing smile. That is why the masquerade is so important. And even more crucial when you feed. <laughs> How do I choose who to feed from? Are there better or worse um, targets? Isolated kind are easiest prey, of course. But much depends on context. Hunting requires a different approach in a busy club than it does on an empty street. With time you will have the luxury of finding your own preference in hunting methods and prey. Feeding from the same area repeatedly can be dangerous, but by branching out you risk the ire of other kindred on whose domains you trespass. <laughs> 